Hello and welcome to today's webinar looking at what it will cost for social landlords to deliver well-maintained zero uh, carbon homes by 2050. Today's event sponsored by Art Consultancy will look at the scale of the asset management and investment challenge that the sector now faces. And most importantly, what action social landlords could be taking and what, what lobbying position they should, should perhaps be taking as well. So lots to, lots to talk about. And before I introduce um, the panel today, um, and we've got a fantastic um, a group of people lined up to talk us through this, um, I'll just run through a bit of background to set the scene. While there's plenty for us to debate and talk about today, um, I, th I think there's one thing that there is definitely general agreement about, and that is that the size of the task is vast. Our own research at Inside Housing at the end of last year, go, go and check that out, um, suggested that decarbonising the UK social housing stock, hitting that zero carbon uh, target by 2050, could cost £104 billion. Obviously, that comes on top of other commitments like fire safety work and, and regular planned maintenance and investment in homes. Clearly, these agendas are linked to what decisions around asset management and stock disposal, for example, will landlords be tempted to make as a result. And our research um, about back in November also found that while some landlords had started to plan for and cost um, those zero carbon um, uh, pipelines, many were, were barely out of the starting block. So there was still quite a lot of distance left to travel for um, a lot of landlords. So today we'll be looking at what zero carbon will mean for the sector and the asset management decisions that might um, uh, be taken as a result. We'll ex be exploring what landlords anticipate spending to decarbonise their stock and how it will be funded. And we'll also be asking how this work is likely to impact on the wider economy and uh, potentially how it might help in terms of employment in, in uh, the recovery that follows the pandemic. So yeah, pl plenty for us to talk about, lots to get stuck into, so let's, let's crack on. As I mentioned earlier, we've got an absolutely fantastic panel lined up to talk us through things today. We'll be hearing from Stephen Brookfield, Director of Housing and Asset Management at Housing Solutions, John Fisher, Director of Art Consultancy, Joe Hills, Director of Assets and Services, at Raven Housing Trust, Susan French, Chief Executive of Barnsbury Housing Association, and last but not least, Ted Pierce, Strategic Assets Director with Orbit. So welcome all. And uh, before I introduce our first panelist this morning, just a quick reminder to everybody tuning in today um, that this is absolutely your opportunity to, to, to ask the questions and get the answers um, to, to the problems you're wrestling with. So um, please ask away. It's, it's, it's very much designed to be useful to you and to, to, to help you with the questions you're, you're wrestling with in your own organizations. So do use that Q&A box throughout the presentations and I'll pick up on as many questions as possible in the the, uh, session that, that follows those presentations. Um, so yeah, do, do, do get asking away and we'll pick up on as many as, as possible. Right, that is more than enough from me. Um, so let's kick things off in style. Um, Stephen, it's, it's over to you. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon to um, everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, the guys that are in on uh, what the net zero carbon uh, target has done for our inter, um, investment program and our asset management strategy. Um, so I thought I'd do that by covering the same six questions that I always ask at the start of a new project. Um, and now really, where are we starting from? Where are we now? Um, where do we need to be? Well, that's set for us for uh, net zero carbon for 2050. Obviously, how are we going to get there? How much will it cost? Um, and importantly, who are we going to get there with? Who do we need to partner? Who do we need to collaborate with uh, to make sure we get there? Uh, the last question about how we measure success, I'm going to skip over today through time constraints, but um, of course, we all need to make sure that we know uh, what success looks like at the end. Um, so moving swiftly on, really just talking about um, where we are now. Uh, the team at Housing Solutions has done some really good work over the last couple of years, really ensuring that we've got a comprehensive set of data. Uh, we've got EPC data for uh, well over 99% of our properties. We've got a few stragglers that we still need to get into. Um, and we've done some work over the last uh, six to nine months with, with John and Ark, who uh, will be speaking after me, uh, really just trying to analyse that data and understand uh, what that means for the journey that we need to take. Um, what it showed us actually is that the, the state of our properties is pretty good from an energy efficiency point of view. 77% of all of our properties have got a, a C rating and above, uh, which is a really good start. 
when we compare it to both private and uh, public landlords, actually that puts us in a, a pretty good place. It's also identified though, a relatively small number of properties that we understand are going to be really very challenging um, to meet this target. Um, probably impossible actually, and raises a couple of really challenging um, questions for both us and the sector as a whole about what are we gonna do with those properties and whether really just disposing of them and making it somebody else's problem really helps to solve the overall net zero carbon target or whether we're really passing that uh, problem on to another organization that will, will struggle in the same way. Uh, so really challenging questions really. Um, we've had two separate strategy uh, days with our board um, focused on, on, on these challenges. Um, and out of that comes some really, some really interesting um, thoughts actually. Um, but most strongly um, that the organization needs to embrace the change. Uh, this shouldn't be something that we really just, we think is imposed on us by central government and something that we have to do. And that the only way really to get there positively is to embrace it for what it is and, and the positive changes that it will bring. Um, and the other things that come out really about where we want to, where we want to position ourselves um, during this journey. Um, and one of the really strong messages that came out was about being funding ready um, you'll all recognise, I'm sure, um, that this, this area has been subject to government funding in the past and definitely will be in the future. But that funding has tended to be quite short term, somewhat sporadic, and has ended as quickly as it started. So it's really important as organisations that we can be ready for that funding as and when, it, as and when it's available to us, frankly, to, to meet this challenge. And that really, you'll all recognise the, um, the early adopter innovation chart on the left hand side, I'm sure. Um, and we, we spoke at uh, some length really about where we wanted to position ourselves as an organisation and very strongly decided that where we wanted to be was at the beginning of that early majority adopters. Um, realistically, we're not in a place um, where we can be leading edge um, um, innovators in this field. Um, but we really want to make sure that we are doing that horizon scanning piece so that we are ready for uh, new ideas, new technology, um, and new developments as and when they arrive. So really at the beginning of that early majority uh, section. So the big question probably for lots of us about how much this will cost. Um, there's still work to do of course um, in this area, but we estimate that it's likely to cost the organization uh, about 62 million pounds um, in our current 30 year business plan. So a significant investment for any organization. Um, so really we've done a, a fair bit of work about mapping out the timing of that investment and where it is best best placed to get the best value for the investment for our organization. And there's probably two things that are shown by this graph really. One is that we're expecting quite a, quite a lot of the investment to be at the latter end of the next 30 years. Um, there is gonna be um, fading, um, funding opportunities and most importantly, a significant amount of R&D going on, both in our sector and in the wider society that will allow us to deliver on some of these aspirations. And we want to make sure that we are making best use of that technology and allowing for the funding to be in place for, uh, for when we need it. Uh, the second and probably quite stark um, thing that this graph tells us is actually that we're planning to spend a relatively small amount of money on this over the next four or five years. And that is very um, clearly because we have got some um, like most of our um, organisations, I guess. Some fire safety issues uh, that we are dealing with at the moment. We are quite lucky that we don't have a significant number of high rise buildings, but we are quite consciously putting safety first and we, do, we intend to deal with that problem before we invest in significant money in, into, into this challenge. So just moving on, really thinking up, picking up some of the challenges that are obviously ahead of us. I'm sure you'll all recognise some of these challenges. Um, and the only ones I would pick out, pick out really are those ones that really affect our customers, the ones that the residents uh, are involved in. And it's absolutely crucial that we bring our residents along on this journey. Um, certainly at the moment, um, whilst they'll all be aware of it and actually uh, want to be part of a net zero carbon solution, I'm sure, many of our customers have other priorities right now. And those, those priorities have been exacerbated uh, by the COVID situation. Um, and we must make sure that the solutions that we deliver for them actually help their position right now, uh, both in the short and medium in medium term. Uh, we have lots of our customers are right on the edge of fuel poverty and the, and the solutions that we put in place now must make that position better, not worse. Um, and it is very clear to me that some of the technology at the moment 
uh, Air, Source, Air Source heat pumps, for example, actually don't deliver on that commitment to deal with fuel poverty issues. Uh, so last couple of uh, slides from me. It's very clear that we won't succeed um, on this journey on our own. Uh, if ever there was a project uh, for the sector that needs cooperation and collaboration, this is definitely it. I'm sure that we are looking outside of our own sector. This is not something that the housing uh, sector can solve on its own. We need input from all sorts of different people, um, not least um, from tech, from um, uh, industry to come up with new technologies to allow us to deliver on these, from the utility companies. Um, you would have heard a lot of conversation about the need to harmonise the power grid. Um, and we need to do that with the utility companies, um, not in isolation. And of course, most importantly, we all need to work together, come up with solutions that, that help us all deliver um, on, this, on this global ambition. Um, thank you very much. Fabulous. Um, yeah, really great start. Lots and lots of food for thought and lots of questions coming in already. Um, thank you uh, very much. Do do keep using that Q&A box and I will pick up on as many as possible um, when we finish, finish the presentations. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Lots, lots, lots for us to think about and pick up on in, in that question and answer session that follows. Um, right. Um, without further ado, uh, John, the floor is your, yours. It's wel welcome and it's over to you. Martin, thank you. Uh, Steve, thanks very much for that. Um, what I want to look at is just some of the sort of sector-wide issues, um, and Martin picked some of these up in, in his introduction. So the, the, the question we're facing is what's it going to cost for social landlords to secure consistently well-maintained net zero homes by 2050? And I just want to look at the slightly, slightly wider picture. Uh, this is all about the asset management strategic plan for an individual organisation and the sum of those for the sector as a whole. Um, and for a plan to be effective, we've got to understand what we need to invest um, and why and where. Um, and so information at the beginning and good planning is absolutely critical. Um, as Martin said, there's already a big spend in asset management. Our data tells us about £2,300 on average per home per annum is what should be being spent, plus um, the immediate requirements of additional building safety spend. Um, plus decarbonisation. All that needs to be considered um, in an in, in a asset management strategy, which will be now 30 years plus. Um, a plea really from me is I think we uh, missed as a sector a big opportunity with decent homes. We created decent homes. These pictures, believe it or not, certainly the two on the left are decent homes. But decent homes didn't look at the community, it didn't look at the neighbourhood, it didn't look at the sense of place. Um, we must avoid zero carbon becoming another sort of home box ticking exercise. Um, and we must make sure that we look at um, the, 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 the resident perspective as much as we look at um, the condition of the property um, and look at, at all of that in the round to make sure that people have decent homes um, in, in decent places. Um, to do that, it's about using data um, intelligently. There's a huge amount of data in the sector. And a little graph um, on, on this slide shows uh, considerable amounts of data at property and scheme level pulled into a, uh, a, an organised and sophisticated analysis, um, showing effectively um, the uh, in the vertical axis, the uh, financial performance of assets against a, 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 an asset score driven by uh, qualitative measures, not least, um, and particularly um, the, the performance from a resident's point of view, from staff's point of view. It's the sum of those things that decide whether assets perform well or not. And putting energy data um, in, in the round towards um, zero carbon uh, is going to improve our understanding of asset performance, not only now, but about where it can get to um, in the future. So my plea is that as a sector, we look at um, the the whole road to zero carbon um, as just being part of um, of a bigger journey, which is about effective asset management. Um, once we understand how assets perform, understanding those in the neighbourhood and community context is critical. So again, use of good data. Uh, let's understand um, that we we are asking people to live in places which behave um, in the way they would want them to and, and uh, support communities uh, positively. Um, so the, the, the carbon challenge um, is um, one that 
you're all facing uh, the next 30 years. We're into that 30 year period already. Um, the cost um, varies from, from nothing, homes that are already zero carbon, we haven't got many of those, um, to those which need significant investment. I saw a case study a few days ago uh, for homes that are costing upwards of £90,000, still cheaper um, than replacing those homes. Um, and the embodied carbon argument for that was very strong. Um, data we see across the sector is suggesting the typical range for the majority of stock is around between sort of 13 and, and 30,000 with a sort of average cost of typically around 20,000 which is consistent with the figure Martin quoted at the beginning. The, 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 the asset management ch um, challenge, the trick, is to understand asset performance in the round, what, what uh, future energy performance um, can be, the cost of achieving that and the embodied carbon um, cost um, and put all those together and understand which homes don't meet that requirement. And I think there's going to be somewhere between 15 and 20 percent if we do that properly. There might be a strong embodied carbon um, argument to keep a home and invest in it. But if it's not a decent home that people don't really want to live in, actually, we need to think again. So I think regeneration is going to increase as a proportion of what we do. I'm suggesting 20%. I um, can't validate that yet. It's less than 1% per year, but I think that's that's coming our way. In terms of cost, again, Martin touched on this at the beginning. Um, I think the 104 billion is a uh, is a sensible estimate across the UK. Um, that's on top of the sort of 350 billion for just doing asset management and investing sensibly in homes and building safety on top of that. That means lots of jobs. Um, and it means uh, lots of work um, for uh, the construction industry. It means lots of work for the supply chain. Um, and obviously what the supply chain is, is providing and will provide in the future to help on this journey is going to evolve and change and develop. So a few final thoughts from me. Um, this isn't just, if we think of it in market terms, we're only 17% of, of the whole market. And this is a journey for all homes. So the market impact in terms of jobs, um, um, the supply chain um, and funding is significant, far more significant than we're facing. Um, so um, to fund it, um, I've not dwelt on any detail here. There are various options, but we need to be having the debate about if we bring bills down, is there an argument to put rents up and share the benefits of that to create some funding? And I don't really see the sector having that discussion yet. Um, in terms of what we do, keep it as simple as we can. We made lots of mistakes in the 1990s, putting schemes that were too complex in that people couldn't operate. Let's not do that again. Fabric first and then technology that's, that, that, that works and is understandable. Um, again, regeneration, if we're going to do that, Let's engage with and embrace modern methods of construction, build new homes off-site efficiently to a very, very high standard and make them zero carbon now. Plan it properly. Um, this isn't a race. We're in it together. So if we do that together uh, and collaborate in what we do, we've got a chance of delivering the outcome by 2050. But it's a, it's a long journey and one we need to take at a sensible pace. So from your own points of view, good luck with that, with that journey and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, great, great presentation. Lots, lots to get stuck into um, in a few minutes' time. We've got loads of questions coming in, um, but do do, do uh, take advantage of that Q and A box. It's absolutely your opportunity to to ask the questions um, that are going to be useful to you um, uh, and inform your thinking back at your own organisation. So um, yeah, just a reminder that that is there, and, and please ask away. Um, thank you very much, John. Um, Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Um, uh, please take it away. Welcome. Great, thank you, Martin. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to talk about Raven's journey um, and uh, flowing on quite neatly, I think, from what others have said before. So what is the influence on our asset management strategy? Um, we're, we're moving from the concept of just management under asset management strategy to much more of an active investment with um, 
we've met, other people have touched on it, void sales and regen. Um, regen in particular um, forming quite a significant part of our strategy. Um, so we've actually scrapped our uh, asset management strategy entirely and we've now got an investment and regen strategy um, because it's just changed the entire way that we're having to look at things. So the first step first thing that we had to do is to look at all of the impacts of all of the new things that are coming our way because it's not just the net zero plan it's the building safety plan and also the existing assets the existing assets we're also under pressure from the white paper to improve quality for for residents um, and and to look at things more widely as well so pulling all of those together we we've, we've pulled together a a, a funding needs um, uh, uh, a strategy um, together with some timeframes. So I think others have touched on the cost already. We were also, when we did our analysis, we also came out with about um, £20,000 per home being the um, carbon spend. For us, that totals up to um, £115 million. Um, and our existing total planned and cyclical programs, 30 year spend of £470 million. So we're looking at a 25% increase in our spend um, over the coming years, which is huge. It's a huge impact for us. Um, moving on, sorry. The, um, so we've started. Uh, so we started out. Our very first thing to do was to find out how we, what we needed to prioritise um, and focus on. Particularly, we started out with the carbon footprint, um, and in 2019, our homes, our existing homes, were 98% of our footprint. I think we'll find now it's even more so because at that time, staff commuting was um, nearly a 1%. And I think nowadays um, that's going to be reduced even into a long-term future. But it was re really hugely significant because I think when people talk about sustainability strategy, you straight away start thinking about uh, recycling and, uh, and, and all sorts of things in the office. But actually, it was all about our homes in terms of the footprint. And that's where we really needed to prioritise. Um, so, looking at the spread of, of costs across the different homes, um, this was quite an interesting analysis that we did. The number of homes that we've got that are not going to cost us very much, that's on the left-hand side of, of the chart, that are not going to cost us very much to retrofit versus the ones on the right-hand side, which are going to be very expensive. Um, and you, you can see quite visibly where we where we did an, a new build program. Um, we've got a big lump there of ones on the left-hand side that, were, that won't cost us much to retrofit. The ones on the right hand side are the ones that we really need to focus on. Um, they are the problem ones um, that we've spent a bit of time thinking about. So what are the options for each of those categories? Um, if they're totally unviable, we are planning to dispose or regenerate. Um, it looks around about 13% of our stock will fall into that category, vast majority of which is regeneration. Um, and the thinking there is it's not going to be viable for us to do anything else, to be honest. The, some of these homes will cost too much and be too difficult to retrofit, um, as was referenced by the previous speakers. Some of them are just plain unpopular with our with our customers. People don't want to live in them. Um, we've, got, we've got things like bed sits upstairs from sheltered schemes, um, sort of general needs bed sits upstairs from shelters, things that just just don't make anyone happy to live in, to be honest. Um, so we're, we're looking at complete refurbishment, regeneration and disposal. And it shifts the costs then into, um, into capital that's, uh, that's easy to borrow against. Um, we're looking at, for the properties that are high cost, we're looking at whole house retrofit. Um, on-site energy, but off-site manufacture. And, and here's part of, of how we're hoping to address the um, costs of this is through innov innovation in the ways of delivery as well. Um, medium cost one, we're doing fabric first, uh, as John just uh, talked about, um, improving the insulation and ventilation and then swapping out the heat source and, and the electricity. And for the low cost ones, these are ones where they're relatively new build, pretty well insulated already. So our focus is just on swapping out the heat source and the ventilation, minor fabric works in included. So the big question that you're all most interested in, I think, is how on earth do we fund this? 
So the disposal and regeneration, so um, a lot of you will already be doing um, development programs um, and have a stream that enables you to borrow against your existing properties in order to invest in, in building. Now, we've been doing a lot of Section 106 um, development over the past few years, um, and we're shifting that strategy entirely towards um, building on our own sites. So, so that is a complete change, and it will mean a change in the skills within our team, much more controlled, much more construction management. In our new build, we're taking the strategy of moving to net zero carbon wherever possible, appreciate on occasion, it may not be possible, but wherever possible from now, um, because there's absolutely no point in building things right now that we're going to have to come along and retrofit in the future. And where where it isn't possible for any reason, then we're building in the cost of the future retrofit into our initial feasibility assessment. Um, and that I think that's really important. If people are building things now that they're going to have to retrofit later, it, it's it's just a real waste of time. And back to John's commentary about the um, decent homes mistakes of the past. Um, we we are talking about disposal as well. A few sales when void um, on the basis that they're going to the private sector um, and that the government it will be dealing with um, private sector in due course with through incentivization and so on. So yes, it will be someone else's problem, but uh, no, it's not that it won't get dealt with. Um, that's the theory. We're bringing forward future spend is the next thing on my list. So. There are some elements of work that we're doing in the course of net zero carbon, which will mean that we won't need to do future works um, where, for instance, where we're um, putting on external wall insulation, we, we won't need to be doing anything on the wall finishes for a while. Um, doors and windows will get replaced that won't then need replacing again within the, the, the span of the business plan. So, um, so that enables us to net out some of our um, future expenditure. There are grants. Um, I appreciate this, this. This is uncertain into the future at the moment, but there are grants um, and we are assuming that we will be focusing quite heavily on fundraising. Um, the ESG linked funding, so ESG being um, absolutely the way of the future to the point that some fi finance institutions are now saying that all of their funds will in future be ESG linked. So we need to be doing this in order to access funds, but also it will give us more credibility with funders. Um, there are potentially other savings. If we don't claim the cost back from residents, residents will be better placed to be paying their rents. So um, we're assuming that arrears would drop. I'll come down, back to that in my final point there. Innovation and collaboration, we're looking very heavily at um, continuous improvement in our, in our work. So we will be um, in our procurement, we're looking at um, setting goals for the contractors, um, setting targets. If they meet the targets, we can move on and, and continue to, to progress the next project. If they don't meet the targets, then we would need to review do the apply lean process engineering, um, continuous improvement practices. Um, we're looking at um, offsite production, so m sort of maximising the simplicity of what we're doing um, and um, uh, and and the low costs of um, producing in factory offsite. Um, and collaboration as well, working very closely with partners and with the supply chain um, and innovating together and learning together. Resident contribution is a has been a big topic of debate. Um, so we are investing a lot of money in people's homes. Um, some organisations are talking about clawing that back from the um, residents who live in them um, because they will be making savings on their bills. Um, and that's a, a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Um, we at Raven are thinking probably we won't um, because we want the customers to benefit because we're very clear that there's a lot of upheaval and, and unsettlement for people as well. So we, we may not. And a lot of other people will take that middle line in between where they do, uh, where they, where they recover part of it.
Um, so yes, so in answer to what is the uh, influence on our asset management strategy, it's huge and it's overwhelming and it is changing everything. But we're feeling that we're now in a, a really good place. We've got our strategy. Um, it's about to get finalised um, next week and all the funding um, should be in place uh, within the next year. We've got a few small projects starting up already. We did a couple last year as well. Um, and so, yeah, we're feeling very confident about the future, but it is a huge challenge. Thank you very, very much, Joe. Um, yeah, that, that, that's uh, a, a, an interesting note to to, 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 to end on. Um, but but good, good, good to hear, feeling confident about the future, and and, and yeah, lots of questions there around the, the kind of asset management strategies and how um, how, how that will kind of play out moving forwards, and, and questions coming in um, along those lines from from people in the Q and A box. Um, just a reminder to the audience, um, please do use that box. Um, there's there's loads of questions coming in already, um, but but do take that opportunity, and we'll, we'll get we'll pick up on as many as possible following. The presentations. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, Susan, uh, it's, it's over to you. So, well, welcome and um, yeah, uh, p p please uh, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. So, um, I'm Chief Exec of Barnsbury Housing Association, which is a, a very small association in North London. Uh, we've got 300 homes, some very lovely homes, as you can see some of, from some of these photos. Um, but you can probably also see some of the challenges that we that we face in our retrofit um, journey. About a third of the homes that we uh, own are listed buildings, uh, and almost all of them are in conservation areas. So that's a particular angle on it for us. Um, and my perspective today is from that of somebody who's sort of leading a small organisation. I'm not an expert, I'm not an asset manager, a technical expert, but I'm someone who's trying to lead an organisation and sort of navigate our way through uh, what's quite a maze uh, towards zero carbon. Having said that, there's lots of common issues and common themes with, 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 with the other speakers today. So in terms of where we, we started um, from, um, our board uh, at a at a um, away day uh, about 18 months or so ago, uh, made a strategic commitment to, to decarbonise. Um, the backdrop to that was the fact that we knew that over a third of our tenants really struggled to pay their heating bills. Um, and the board felt that this was an area where, you know, because of our size, because of our, our agility, we could, uh, you know, we could really make a difference. Um, we committed some funding to it, uh, took some advice, including from ARC, uh, we started off measuring our carbon footprint, looking at the SAP data that we had, um, and we know that uh, more than 60% of our homes are uh, D-rated or below, so we've got quite a challenge. Um, and we started to sort of think about the principles and what we'd be trying to achieve by, by when. We were just about, at the time, we were just about to start uh, some major works on a, a terrace of uh, Victorian flats, which you can see here. Um, and we thought we'd sort of take the opportunity to see whether we could incorporate some um, energy efficiency measures into that into that project and started working with uh, energy consultants called Inhabit. And the aim of our project with them is to try and develop a, a sort of retro, get, get the flats retrofit ready so that at every point we go back to them over the next 10 or 20 years, we can uh, add more energy uh, efficiency measures that sort of build on and complement what, what we've done before. You know, we, we don't end up ripping out things that, um, that we put in a few, a few years ago. And we're just about to uh, develop a pilot project in one of those flats, not least to test the, the planning process, because I think planning is going to be a really big issue for us. These are listed, listed buildings. We reckon that's going to cost us about £25,000 of property. Um, so a big, a big uh, cost for us. Uh, we've also been doing some work. We managed to secure some green homes grant through our local authority. Uh, we've been working uh, on some energy advice service with tenants um, and started to engage tenants, try to bring tenants along with us uh, on, this, uh, on this journey. In terms of sort of next steps for us, we're just in the process of uh, getting EPCs across all of our schemes. Uh, and then we will look at every scheme on a, you know, and, and develop a bespoke plan really. Um, for them and try to then integrate uh, the, the, the costs and the, uh, the planning into our 30-year assets investment plan. Uh, we're also just about to start some quick wins, you know, the easy things that you can do is draft proofing, loft insulation, LED lights, that sort of stuff. Um, 
thinking about a green void standard. So what can we do every time a property is let, you know, to help um, cut costs for bill, uh, cut, cut bills for tenants as they come through? Um, and we're also going to be looking for a green board member. If anybody's interested. Um, what have we learned? Um, it's a really, for, you know, for a small association, it's a really steep learning curve. I keep describe, John will recognize this, I describe it as a Rubik's Cube, trying to sort of get everything into line, try to think of all of the facets of this. Um, and I think for many small organizations, it's currently uh, on this kind of too difficult pile. I think I've learned quite a bit about your ambitions versus what's possible. Um, we've got our business plan going go to our 30-year business plan going to our board tonight. Um, and for the first time, that's including uh, cost of decarbonisation, which is about six or seven million pounds. And basically, it wipes out all of our development capacity for the next the next 30 years. So it's, you know, it's really clear to us, not just an issue for us, I think it's an issue for the whole sector, that uh, you know, it's not possible to do building safety, zero carbon, and build new homes without a really substantial uh, you know, input of grant funding towards the, the zero carbon agenda. I think like others, we've learned that some of our homes will probably never reach a decent standard. Um, you know, we're starting to have conversations about what happens to them. Disposals is a really tricky issue for us because uh, it's very difficult to develop where we work. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of with John that I think if we don't uh, make these improvements to homes, kind of who, who, who will really? Um, planning, you know, this, this is, we've had lots of conversation. We started a conversation with our planning authority, um, but I think, I think there's a quite a long way to go for planning uh, departments and conservation generally to think about how heritage properties are going to be uh, treated, um, you know, and the compromises that are going to have to be made on, 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 on you know, if we're, if we're achieve, going, going to achieve uh, zero carbon by, um, by 2050. I think I've learned to start with the easy wins, see where you can get to with that. Um, take tenants with you. Other people have mentioned that. And I think for particularly for smaller associations, don't be at the cutting edge. Um, this photograph here is a, a two homes, two very lovely homes that we took as part of a section 106 uh, a few years ago on what was a, um, a development, a lovely development that uh, won national sustainability awards. But as far as we're concerned, you know the measures in there there's lots of tech in there it's really costly for us to maintain it, it isn't popular with tenants uh, and it adds complexity and risk to you know just for, particularly for small organizations i think in terms of the challenges for leaders um i think it's got to get off the too difficult pile um but as part of that uh you know try and you know be ambitious but it's, you've got to be kind of pragmatic and i think the starting point is really looking at your stock uh, you know, what's needed in terms of the improvements that have to be made, what's possible, uh, what's it going to cost, but then position your organisation to make sure that when, uh, you know, the decarbonisation funding does come along, uh, that you're, you, you're able to go, you're able to attract that, that, that funding. Um, how, how to make it part of the day job, you know, we're looking at how we can incorporate some of the easy wins into our day-to-day -day operations so what can repairs contractors do when they go into properties you know draft proofing what can our caretakers do um how can our, our, our housing team signpost people to energy saving advice um you know what what, what benefits can we uh, you know sort of get get to get to that way and i think it's really echo what the, some of the other spe speakers have said which is that um there's a huge amount of thinking going on within the sector at the minute about about this lots of different groups all talking about the same thing and i feel there's a really uh, important message about not reinventing the wheel um, and i've been sort of lobbying the nhf uh, you know to, to help particularly small organizations develop a roadmap you know to sort of so we can sort of see the way ahead on this um, and I think if I've got one takeaway for today, it is echoing other people collaborate. I think particularly small organisations, we can't uh, deliver this alone. We've got to find ways for the sector to work together to deliver zero carbon. That's it. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, great presentation. Uh, and um, yeah, there's some interesting questions coming through. I mean, at that point there about um, kind of taking tenants with you, some interesting questions coming through along those lines as well, which we'll pick up on in, in a, a very few minutes. Um, 
Thank you very much. Um, loads of questions coming in. Um, uh, really interesting how just how um, uh, many, many are coming in at the minute. Um, do, do take that chance to, to ask any um, pressing questions you've got, and I'll try and get through as many as possible um, very shortly, um, which brings us uh, very neatly to our, our final presentation this morning. Uh, Ted, welcome. Um, the, the floor is yours, so please take it away. Ted, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I can't hear you at the moment. Can uh, or just just using the, the chat box? Are, are, are you are you there? And can can you hear us? Um, yeah, because we can see your presentation, but um, I can't hear you. And I think yeah, I think that's a problem for the the, the audience as well. Um, from from what I'm seeing from the, the chat box, um, yeah, Ted. I, th I think we're, we're we're struggling to hear you at the moment. Um, perhaps if you can refresh um, and uh, cut, come back in, that 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 will be great. Um, apologies. Can, can you hear me now, Martin? Oh, I can hear you now. Yes, you are you are, you are li live and clear. Okay, um, so over to you, Ted. Thank you very much. So um, good afternoon, everybody. It's just great to hear from uh, the previous speakers. A uh, little bit about Orbit before I run into these uh, six slides. So um, Orbit has 47,000 assets across the south of England, Midlands and the east. Uh, over 80% of those are already EPC, C and above. And as, uh, as John at, uh, at ARC has already pointed out, our estimated costs are also in that range. We think 500 million is an absolute minimum and probably up to 600 million to get our properties to, to net zero carbon. So uh, we're a developing association that that's important in the context of these slides, and you'll see that in a moment. And something like 2,000 new properties, up to 2,000 new properties, come into our portfolio every year. So we're aligned to that complete customer journey. Um, and this first slide, really, is just to talk through some key dates and some key facts. The takeaway I'd like to give you from this slide, really, is that the legislation and regulation is really gathering pace now. Those of you that can look back to 2008, as the financial crisis hit, felt everything change. But at the moment, you can really sense that these recent announcements on things like future home standards, we've got some announcements in due course about, uh, about home heating and so forth, new build being net zero ready, no new fossil fuel heating post-2025. And I think we're starting to see a real emphasis in shift away from uh, you know pure EPC and pure SAP through to measured at meter performance, the actual performance of an asset is going to become more and more important. So, uh, as Martin has said, there's 104 billion uh, estimated, but actually, how much will the government fund of that? We've got a 4 million thereabouts social homes in the UK, but there's 28 million homes in total across the UK, and the vast majority of those, as we've heard, they're not net zero carbon either. So there's some big questions we're developing here. You can sense as to what it means for UK PLC in terms of jobs, in terms of investment, in terms of technology, and also in terms of innovation. Now, this is a very busy slide. Uh, no apologies for this. But effectively, net zero actually can sit in a very much broader context. So this is Orbit's um, management tool. And you'll see that the environmental policy embraces a lot of other areas. So you'll see net zero carbon there in the black box, really important. But there's also a lot of legislation coming forward now about biodiversity net gain. So what's your, what's your position around biodiversity net gain? We'll talk about supply chain in due course, but what is the sustainability of your supply chain? And actually, most importantly, at the bottom of this slide, carbon-free heat and warmth in anybody's home is completely different to operate, completely different to control, and a very different experience for your customers. So actually bringing your customers with you on this journey becomes very, very important. And similarly, it's actually very, very different for your supply chain to manage, to manage the installs, to manage the maintenance, to get these assets working correctly. So lots of things to think about here. Now, group-wide carbon footprint. You might have heard people talking about different carbon scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three. The definitions are there, rough and tough, just as working examples. You'll see here that actually 31% of the carbon that uh, our business is accountable for 
is created as a consequence of how our homes are heated and presented to our customer base. That's a huge number for our business. But actually, as you'll see, 67% of the carbon actually sits in the supply chain. You remember at the top of this slide deck, I was talking about those 2,000 homes a year that are built in the business. Building property at the moment is incredibly carbon intensive. So the total carbon picture for the business is a much, much more complicated matter than simply looking at net zero carbon for existing properties. But goodness me, that's a big enough problem as it is. So if we turn to that now in terms of our existing portfolio, our strategy is around, as you've heard previously, around this staged approach. So the first phase here, we're really looking at getting our fabric sorted out. Now, our average property is producing something like something like 200 kilowatts hours per meter per hour of per annum, sorry, of demand off of the grid gas or grid electric. We've got to get that down to something like 50 kilowatt hours per meter per annum. Now, that requires our fabric to be that much better. Similarly, the ventilation of that fabric as it seals up has to be really well thought through. As a second part of this, as electrification of heat becomes more viable because we need to pull less energy off the grid, we start as a second stage to take the fossil fuel based energy sources out of the house. What we're then looking to do, and you can see the timeline here, is then to look at the renewable energy solutions that are required to take that grid electric away as well. There's a big dependency here on the rate at which the grid itself decarbonizes. What we'll find is at the very end of this process, and you can see the timelines, there's probably still half a ton or thereabouts of carbon per dwelling being produced. The best way to deal with that will be some sort of further carbon offsetting. A lot of the definitions around net zero at the moment suggest that 0.4 tonnes might be the maximum. So, um, so finally, all the way through that, there are changes for your customer base. There are changes in how their homes work, changes in how they operate technology, changes in how they heat their homes, changes in how they experience that heat. And actually the campaign required to bring our customers with us is going to be very de demanding. So penultimate slide here around our challenges and risks. And you can see there are all sorts of risks around this. There aren't any very, very clear standards. SAP is a good tool, but EPC actually is primarily used as a cost-based index. If you look at the words alongside that beautiful A to G colored diagram on your certificates, it actually says, and I quote, the higher the rating, the lower your fuel bills are likely to be. That's not the same as net zero carbon, although SAP itself is a good uh, fig for that. Second of all, we've spoken about the 28 million houses in the UK that might require some sort of decarbonisation. Well, over the next 28, 29 years, that's a million homes a year. That's 20,000 homes a week to retrofit to some extent. And at the moment, the energy white paper that came out last autumn is suggesting the maximum capacity for electric heat pump installs is only about 30,000 30, a year. So the change in the supply chains is going to be absolutely massive. How do we mitigate them? Everything from that staged investment approach through to really stress testing products, through to genuine innovation and green skills programs. We're looking to invest in that sort of skills gap and see if we can close that down. So finally, before I hand back to, uh, to Martin, think about that EPC data. It's actually useful, but the SAP tool is very powerful. And we're going to come to thinking about in-use energy consumption of a home being key to that sort of net zero carbon journey. That baseline cost, how can we use innovation to really drive down that baseline cost? Um, supply chains need massive change. You, we, we know that 30,000 heat pumps a year isn't going to touch this. So how do we get those supply chains working? The skill sets required to support those are going to have to change really significantly. There's going to be pinch points around the uh, past 2030 to past 2035 uh, qualified staff. And we need real, genuine collaboration to scale up and to drive down cost. And as other speakers have, have mentioned earlier in this presentation, how do we harness the E in ESG? How do we actually harness the funding opportunities that are out there right now, extremely low finance costs for the required investment here for our environmental investment. So 
Um, thank you. Thank you for listening and handing back to Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Ted. Thank you very much, everybody. Some some uh, excellent presentations there. Uh, huge amounts of information, huge amounts of food for thought, um, and a lot of questions coming in as well. Um, uh, 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 an absolute torrent. Uh, so it's brilliant to, to go through. Um, thank, thank you very much for that. And I will move very swiftly on to them because we've got, um, I'll, I'll run over by a few minutes. Um, so we've got about uh, 12 or 13 minutes to get through um, as many of those questions as we possibly can. I'm going to move move uh, straight away to some questions that were asked quite early on, actually, actually um, um, just to make sure that they have been addressed. And I know um, we've, we've gone through this a little bit in, in the presentations. Um, but uh, a number of questions early doors about um, uh, uh, one from Adam Pope, given the huge uncertainties for a whole number of reasons on the cost of delivering uh, 2015 net zero carbon goals, are we cr creating um, estimates now pri primarily to satisfy our, our regulators? Are we engaging with the issues rather than the producing a, a, a figure uh, that we can stand behind? So, yeah, the, to, to what extent are those figures kind of robust? Um, uh, question, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a uh, question from Matthew Gardner. I'd be really interested to know from each of our presenters how they understand the net part of net zero, if housing associations are still creating greenhouse gases in 2050, and they will be, um, how do they expect to get to the net zero position? So a number of questions in, in, in that kind of ballpark. Um, and uh, uh, St Stephen, you, you, your voice has had a rest for a while, so I, I will move to you uh, first on that one, if that's okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think that so the I, I skipped over my last question actually in my presentation about how we will measure success, and there, I don't believe there is a single definition uh, really of what that net zero carbon uh, means, and it will develop over um, over the years as we get nearer the twenty fifty target and the milestones that are sort of between here and then. Um, importantly, I don't think I've spoken to anyone in our sector that thinks that ignoring the problem and and really making it an offsetting problem at the end is the right way forward. So I think as a sector, we've got the right approach to this, and that is focus on reducing the carbon in the first place, reduce our actual usage. Um, Ted was quite right at, um, at the end there that actually the use of the building and the customer interface and how they are going to use that energy is absolutely key. So let's reduce the carbon in the first instance and worry about offsetting, possibly as a last resort, frankly, uh, to deal with the balance at the end. And uh, I'll just uh, while while um, uh, you're on, Stephen, there's a there's a couple of questions come through around that kind of uh, backloading investment. Uh, uh, so it'd be interesting to pick up on that one that's just come through from Peter Cunningham. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, by backloading investment and updating of assets closer to 2050, are you not missing the objectives? Uh, uh, 2050 is too late. The, the, the sooner it's uh, taken uh, actions taken, there the greater the impact. Um, so yeah, just a, a couple of questions along those lines. So. Martin, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And there is a compromise here um, about when we, when we deliver on these reductions. There's obviously a cumulative effect um, overall for the carbon that we produce now and tomorrow and then, uh, next year and the years after. Um, and the quicker we do the work, uh, the quicker we'll reduce that cumulative effect. However, like everything, we have to, we have to focus on value for money. Um, and I think it is very clear that there will be uh, technology opportunities um, uh, centrally funded um, um, the value for money, uh, for the money that we invest. We talked about some huge sums for the sector here um, over the last 45 minutes. And to actually achieve it, we are going to need to ensure that we, we stick to that value for money commitment that we have for all of the other investment that we, that we do. So it really is a compromise. Um, and at Housing Solutions, what we try to do is map out where we think that uh, where the optimum position is um, for that investment level. Thank you very much. R r r really uh, helpful answer. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to very, very quickly um, uh, move to Joe on that on some of those earlier questions about um, uh, uh, from Matthew understanding the net part of net zero, um, and from Adam about uh, yeah how, how robust I guess those those figures are. Um, so uh, Joe, I'll bring you in, and I'm going to move on to a couple of uh, different themes that have emerged in the questions. Um, Joe, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, um, in terms of the net part of net zero, I think we're we're um, 
the greening of the grid is going to help um, towards the the latter part of the strategy. Um, we are inevitably going to have to use electricity for um, heat pumps, um, and so there will always be residual uh, electricity need. Um, and uh, and so we're yeah we we're, we're hoping and assuming that the greening of the grid will help deal with that. Don't we'll be relying on offsetting, uh, which would feel like a failure to be honest. Um, new technologies technologies are, are going to improve over time as well, and so um, we'll be looking to um, take advantage of that over time. What we can see right now is going to be very different to what we see in 20 years' time, um, uh, and and we we can all assume that we'll be in a much better place at that point. Um, in terms of uh, accuracy and so on, who knows? Who knows? We're, as we say, technology is evolving. Grants will be evolving. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, one of the questions in, in there was, was about... Um, uh, are we just doing this for the sake of the regulator? Uh, and no, absolutely not. We, we at Raven, we have done this in order to enable our um, our treasury strategy and our business plan um, to be as realistic as it possibly can be. Um, we've been using it in order to talk to our existing funders to, to bring forward new funding um, and, and to, to make sure that our plans are fully funded and deliverable. And, and, and just in terms of that, those plans, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, just just very quickly, um, I mean, because it's an issue that I think uh, a, a few of the presenters uh, touched on today. I mean, you talked about disposals and that kind of 10 percent um, uh, regen and, and, and disposals that, 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 that perhaps you were looking at. Um, Stephen was talking earlier about this um, uh, this kind of. Uh, balance and, and whether it's a right, kind of the right thing to, to 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 do is it just passing the problem on somewhere else potentially or I mean do, do you, is this going to be a an age of mass disposals and, and mass regeneration and um yeah where, where, where do you kind of stand on that kind of I I I, I guess that's a moral argument about whether it's a, the right thing to do if you like yeah, I, I think it is going to be an era of mass regeneration, um, and regeneration is very much the right thing to do. Um, where I, I know there's the argument about embodied carbon, but where a property is, is literally not really fit for purpose anymore, and nobody wants to live there, it's got all sorts of other problems, you know, perhaps the damp and mold issues, and you know bed sits and, and, and all sorts of configuration problems, accessibility issues, just not fit for the modern age. Regen is the right strategy. Um, sales to market, um, I, I appreciate the, the, um, the difficulties and ambiguities there. Um, and, and yes, if we were all to swamp the market with huge sales, a huge numbers of sales, that wouldn't be sustainable. Um, but I think all of us, were, even those of us who are talking about doing that, we're only talking about doing it for those properties that really won't um, be manageable for the future. Um, so it's not I, i'm hoping we won't be doing that swamping thing and, and certainly raven won't um we're we're all about the regen where we possibly can Th thanks very much for that and i'm going to move very swiftly on because uh, there's a number of questions to get through. Um, a, a number of questions about collaboration uh, as well. Mark Bennett, fundamentally, Net Zero is going to be a huge sector-wide culture change program. Any views on how best we can collaborate? And a question from Anton Schultz, um, the point um, about moving to EP, EPC to um, actual consumption uh, makes sense, but do we need better, more consist uh, consistent sector data sharing agreements uh, with suppliers to utilize that? So um, a bit of a mix, but a similar, a similar theme there. Um, John, uh, would you like to come in on those? Yeah, very happy to, Martin. Thank you. Um, both really, really important questions, and it was a sort of key theme in, in what I was saying earlier. Um, we, as a sector, have um, progressed pretty well, I think, over the last sort of 15 years from being quite competitive to being quite collaborative, certainly in, in some things that we do. That, that journey absolutely needs to complete. So um, it's through consortia arrangements um, with the supply chain but equally, it's through information, knowledge, and sharing. So um, trade bodies, NHF, CIH, got a huge role to play here, but work equally with people like the uh, Building Research Establishment and so on, um, and uh, cohorts of organization under those banners and independently um, getting together um, and sharing information and learning from each other. There are a lot of um, known unknowns, and a lot of unknown unknowns at the moment, and the fact that some of the questions that have come through about what does net zero carbon really mean, there isn't really a right answer in my view yet. We don't know all of the sort of bits of the jigsaw that are going to, going to come together for that, um, and we need to take it at a sensible pace um, 
each organization uh, focusing on what's right for it, but sharing uh, their findings and the information because, you know, 2050 is only 29 years away um, and we will make good progress during that time. But to do it in isolation of each other uh, would be missing a huge opportunity. So if anything um, is going to bring the sector together, um, it, it, it will be this journey for zero carbon, but it goes beyond the sector, particularly around uh, the supply chain and uh, working with um, um, educational and training organisations to create the skills gap that we've got um, that will be needed to do the work that comes through the programmes that this produces. Thanks very much, uh, John. And in terms of that skills point, um, I, I, I'll, I'll raise a, a question that Claire's come come forward. Claire Fallow, um, what all, what are organisations doing in terms of training in-house maintenance teams, in terms of new technologies and retrofit? So, what training uh, should the sector be doing, and how how's it going about that already? Um, and Ted, I'll pick up on a point um, that you made earlier. I think you were, talk, were talking about the the campaign to bring our customers with us is going to be very demanding. And there's a couple of questions along those lines. Jane Elliott, has anybody got any feedback engagement models that would be interested in sharing or collaborating on and uh, uh, Mark Burnett uh, any thoughts on getting residents trained up um, so they can benefit from the jobs um, so again a, a skills and jobs uh, question there um, Ted I, I will bring you in on that if that's okay yeah thanks Martin just checking that the microphone is working okay okay I'm, I'm going to work a little bit thank you so um, yeah so we're looking at a, a green skills training program uh, and we're looking to do that directly. We have an apprenticeship program. We're looking to do that directly as well. So, uh, so we'll do our little bit around the skills gap. But the key thing here, the key thing is going to be around collaboration. The key thing here is about creating the scale that's needed to, uh, to, to drive the supply chain and drive investment. I love the point about the, the uh, getting our customers involved in terms of potentially that sort of workforce around this as well. That could be really important. I think the other area for us to think about is, is how important, and I think it's a few weeks away from being announced now, is just how important the decarbonisation demonstrator fund is going to be. Because for us to get really good data shared widely about the benefits, the risks, the opportunities that this investment provides for our sector and UK PLC, those demonstrator fund projects are going to be critical. And I think Bayes, who have embargoed, I think, the actual announcement for a couple of weeks, are due to announce uh, something in the next month or so. That's a great opportunity for us to learn and share. That, that, that's a really, really interesting point. Uh, so what, watch this space. Um, for those, and, and uh, definitely that, that answered, I think, some of the questions we had. Stuart Coe had a question about, do we think government funding will be forthcoming? Um, and I'll, I might bring you in uh, uh, very quickly on that, that Susan, because um, uh, you, you were talking about decarbonisation, wiping out your development, uh, development capacity for the next 30 years. You need government funding. Do you think those conversations are there? And what, what, what's, what's the best way of, of um, people co collaborating around uh, uh, that? And, uh, yeah, do, do you think that kind of funding is, is likely to be forthcoming? How, how big a worry is that for you? I think it's a it's a it's a real worry. It's probably a real worry for everyone. Um, I think collaboration is really important, and I think I think actually the Nat Fair just sort of really picked up this pattern and is doing some good uh, lobbying with government, uh, you know, around the funding that's needed, around the restraints that are on uh, existing business plans, and, and about the need for funding. Um, I think just on, on the kind of collaboration point, you know, I'm leading a, a G320, which is the group of small housing associations, um, a, a group looking at looking at this issue. And you know, there's a real kind of appetite and willingness from from small organisations to, uh, you know, to sort of pick up on this agenda. But they, the question is kind of where, you know, where do we start? Um, and I think there's the point about the you know collaboration and getting some kind of roadmap for small organisations is uh, it, it really needs to happen. I think in the next uh, the next sort of twelve months or so, you know, so so we can uh, you know to take take those take those first steps. And uh, th th there are a couple of questions we've we've had, and I'll, I'll just round off with this one. But um, uh, I, I think uh, around how you bring tenants uh, with you, and also is there a kind of rent um, element to it? And I know a couple of speakers uh, touched on this earlier, but um, yeah, th 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 I, I think you were saying that that maybe is not not something for you. But um, yeah, to, to what extent are you talking to tenants, and how how best to do that? Well, we. We're talking to ten on the on this sort of the the, the project that we're about to start. You know, we put a uh, 
you know, a, a, a quite a good leaflet together, uh, you know, with, for tenants sort of talking about all of the measures to try and get some kind of feedback from them about what sorts of measures they were interested in, and and how much they they care about this issue. Frankly, and you know, we've got really positive feedback. Um, so you know, we we know that, uh, that there's an appetite for our for our tenants, um, for, you know, for, from from tenants to to, to 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 look at this, and you know, we're sort of talking about whether we can get green champions amongst tenants, uh, you know, to sort of help help us, uh, you know, get get that get that message uh, across. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, absolutely crucial. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, a whole um, other discussion, really. Um, and I might uh, uh, just just uh, on that collaboration point, John, I'll bring you back in very quickly. And there's, uh, Gordon has raised a couple of questions. Do we need to be working better with local authorities so we can tackle things at a street neighbourhood level? So where do local authorities come into this picture of collaboration as well? Um, what, what's, what's their voice? Um, and uh, Gordon has also asked, and I'll, I'll see whether you've got an answer to this one very quickly. Um, do speakers feel hydrogen is a, is a, is a pipe dream? So um, yeah, a, a, a couple of questions to round off, John. Um, yeah, the, the I mean, back to the theme of collaboration. Um, this isn't just about housing providers. Very few um, housing providers who will be participating in in in, in this call um, own all of the homes in the estates and the neighbourhoods that that they manage. So wider collaboration um, between landlords with private owners, uh, with private landlords. Um, and then with local authorities who obviously manage the, the, the adopted spaces um, and have a range of other responsibilities locally uh, becomes absolutely critical. And that's why there's no, there's no right answer to this. There's a, there's a national collaboration requirement about understanding and learning, working with a supply chain, making sure we can deliver um, a huge program of investment going forward. But local collaboration is equally critical to make sure it was probably the key point in what I was saying earlier that we're focusing on on the neighbourhood, the community, as much as the home. If it becomes a regulatory box ticking exercise to say, yeah, we've got those scores from a zero carbon point of view, we rather miss the point. We need to do that for the planet, but we need to do the right thing locally for the people who live in those homes. Thank, thank you uh, very much, John. And I, and I am going to bring things to a, a, a close there. Um, we've, we've run slightly over. Um, but I think I'm, I can safely say uh, we have never had so many questions uh, come through uh, for a webinar before. Uh, great to see so many of you tune in today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panellists for a really, really fascinating discussion uh, and a series of presentations there. Um, and, and thank you all for, for being so engaged. And, and hopefully we've got through a decent cross section of those questions and, and we've, we've got some answers and some takeaways for everybody to go, go back to their businesses with, uh, go back to their organisations with. Uh, this afternoon. So yeah, thank you all very much. Um, thank you also uh, to ARC, uh, our, our sponsors, for, for, for making it all possible today. Um, so, so thank you very much uh, to, to them as well. And um, yeah, really enjoyable discussion. Uh, as, as we can see from that, lots of things to, to, to um, really pick up on and, and keep, keep an eye on moving forwards as well. Um, very, very um, live uh, the, the, the debate. And um, Susan, I'll, I'll certainly be getting in touch with you to find out about the G320 and, and uh, where they're going in terms of that collaboration as well. So lot, lots, of, lots of emerging stories to, to, to follow um, uh, for us over the course of the next year as well. So yeah, thank you all very much for tuning in. Uh, really enjoyable uh, event today and see you all soon, hopefully. Thank you very much.